Chapter Twelve of the Vikings by Alan Mower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Johnson. Chapter Twelve: Scandinavian Influence in the Empire and Iceland. Considering the long and devastating campaign of the Vikings within the Frankish Empire, and more especially within its western portion, it is surprising that they only formed permanent settlements in one small area leaving practically no marks of their presence elsewhere. Great portions of the Low Countries were in almost continuous occupation by them during the ninth century, but the opportunity was lost, and beyond an important share in the development of the trade of Durstead, the Vikings hardly left a sign of their influence behind them. The case of Normandy is different. Here we have a definite district assigned to the invaders, just as the Danelog, was given to them in England, and the whole of that territory is deeply impregnated with their influence. Many of the Norman towns in Ville contain as the first element in their name a Norse personal name, e.g. Cataville, Cauverville, Colville, Folkville, Hacqueville, containing the names Kate, Calfer, Kohler, Folki, Hakon, while the suffixes Beck, Buff, Dale, A, Gard, Lond, Torp, Tot, Tweet, Vic, as in Bolbeck, Elbouf, Sausedal, Jersey, Epigard, Mandelond, Torgestorp, Abitot, Braquetweet, Barvik, go back to Old Norse Becker, Booth, bracket, Booth, and a bracket, Dollar, A, bracket, Island, and a bracket, Garther, Lunder, Thorpe, Topt, Thwaite, Vik. The dialect of Normandy to this day contains a good number of Scandinavian words, and others have been introduced into the standard language. Some of these have also found their way into English through our Norman conquerors, e.g. abet, baggage, elope, equip, jolly, rubbish, scoop, strife, just as the Bulbeck in Swaffham Bulbeck bracket cams and a bracket and bulbeck common above blanchland in northumberland is from the great norman barony of bulbeck so named after bulbeck in normandy of which they once formed part norman law and customs also show many traces of scandinavian influence and so does norman folklore the normans still look to denmark as their homeland down to the end of the tenth century and at least twice during the reign of harold bluetooth their dukes received help from that country. The nobles soon ceased to speak their old northern language, but it is probable that it remained current on the lips of the people for some considerable time longer. The Vikings always showed themselves keenly sensitive to the influence of a civilization higher or more developed than their own, and this is nowhere more apparent than in Normandy. Heathenism found a champion as late as 943 when, on the death of William Longsword, a rising of heathen Normans was crushed with the aid of the Frankish king. But for the most part, the Normans soon showed themselves devout sons of the church, and were destined, in the 11th century, to be numbered among the most ardent supporters of the Crusades. With the adoption of Christianity, they learned to respect and honour those homes of learning which they had once devastated for their wealth of hoarded treasure, and the famous school at Beck, whence came Lanfranc and Anselm, was only one among many which they richly endowed and supported. Their religious and artistic feeling found expression in that development of Romanesque architecture which we know as Norman, and which has given so many famous buildings not only to Normandy but to England, to Sicily, and to southern Italy generally. In literature, the Norman-French Trouvere did much towards popularizing the romances of war and adventure which play so important a part in medieval literature and when they settled in england it was largely due to anglo-norman poets that the matter of britain became one of the great subjects of romance for all time in its social organization normandy seems speedily to have been feudalized rollo divided the land among a comparatively small number of large landholders and the system of land tenure was quite different from that in the English Danelog, 
with its large number of small freeholders. On the other hand, it was probably due to Norse traditions of personal freedom that serfdom disappeared earlier in Normandy than in any other of the French provinces. Trade and commerce were fostered here as everywhere by the Vikings. It was the Normans who first taught the French to become a power at sea. Many French naval terms are of Norman origin, and from the Norman province have come some of France's greatest sea captains. The Vikings, like the Franks before them, threw off their old speech and submitted to the all-embracing power of Latin civilization, and the result was a race endowed with vigorous personality, untiring activity, and the instinct for ruling men. The Normans may have become largely French, but they lost none of their old enterprise and spirit of adventure. In the 11th century, they conquered England and founded great kingdoms for themselves in Sicily and South Italy. No Viking stock was more vigorous than that which resulted from the grafting of Gallo-Latin culture on the ruder civilization of the Teutonic North. Their influence on France as a whole is not nearly as great as the influence of their kinsmen in England, probably because English government was centralized, bracket under Norman rule, end of bracket, much sooner than French government, and their influence was thus able to make itself felt outside the actual districts in which they settled. The settlement of Normandy helped, however, towards the consolidation of power in the hands of Charles the Bald and his successors, much as the settlement of the Danelog helped in establishing the final supremacy of Wessex. It remains to speak of the one great home of viking civilization to which more than one reference has been made in previous chapters viz iceland the story of its settlement is a very simple one it commenced about eight seventy when many great norwegian noblemen sought there for themselves and their followers a freer life than they could obtain under the growing power of harold fairhair it was greatly strengthened by settlers both from norway and from ireland and the western islands when that power was firmly established by the Battle of Hafersfjord, and by the year 930 the settlement was practically complete. Iceland was more purely Scandinavian than any other settlement made during the Viking Age. Here we have not the case of one civilization grafted on to another, and earlier one, as in England, Ireland, or the Frankish Empire, but the transference of the best and finest elements in a nation to new and virgin soil where, for good or ill, they were free to develop their civilization on almost entirely independent lines. Settlers from the western islands and from Ireland may have brought Celtic elements, and Christianity was not without influence, when it was introduced from Norway at the close of the 10th century. But on the whole, we see in Iceland just what Viking civilization was capable of when left to itself. At first the settlers lived in almost complete isolation, political and religious, from one another, but they soon found that some form of organization was necessary, and groups of settlers began by choosing from amongst their number a Gothi, or chieftain, half-priest, half-leader, who was the speaker at their moot, and their representative in negotiation with neighboring groups. Then continued disputes and the lack of a common law, led to the establishment of a central moot or althing, with the speaker to speak one single law for all. But the Norsemen were much better at making constitutions and enacting laws than they were at observing them when instituted, and the condition of Iceland has been vividly, if roughly, summarized as one of all law and no government. The local things, or the national all thing, might enact perfect laws, but there was no compelling force except public opinion, to make them be obeyed. Even the introduction of Christianity made no difference. The Icelanders quarrelled as bitterly over questions of ecclesiastical as of civil law, and the authorities of the medieval church were scandalized by their anarchic love of freedom. In the words of Professor Kerr, the settlers made a commonwealth of their own, which was in contradiction to all the prejudices of the Middle Ages and of all ancient and modern political philosophy, a commonwealth which was not a state, which had no government, no sovereignty. It was anarchy without a police constable. 
the result was that the rich men grew richer the poor became poorer the smaller gentry died out and the large estates fell into fewer and fewer hands the great men quarrelled among themselves intrigued against one another and played into the hands of the norwegian kings who were only waiting their opportunity it came in the days of hakon the old lands and thanes were sworn into subjection to that king at the althing in twelve sixty two and in twelve seventy one the old icelandic common law was superseded by a new norse code the failure of the icelandic commonwealth is amply compensated for by the rich intellectual development of icelandic literature which owed many of its most characteristic features to the fact that it was written in a land almost completely isolated and detached from the main currents of western medieval thought and the general trend of european history but in itself that failure is full of deepest import for a right understanding of the part played by viking civilization in europe powerful and highly developed as that civilization was in many ways it only reached its highest and best expression when brought into fruitful contact with other and older civilizations there it found the corrective for certain inherent weaknesses more especially for certain tendencies of too strongly individualistic character leading to political and intellectual anarchy while at the same time by its own energy and vigour it quickened the life of the older civilizations where they were tending to become effete or outworn the germanic peoples had done much for the development of european civilization in the time of the wanderings of the nations but by the end of the eighth century they had lost much of their pristine vigour through contact with the richer and more luxurious civilization of the roman world it was reserved for the north germanic peoples or the northmen as we can more fitly describe them in the ninth and tenth centuries to give a yet more powerful stimulus to european life if not to european thought a stimulus which perhaps found its highest expression in the great creations of the norman race in the world of politics the world of commerce the world of architecture and the world of letters end of chapter 12 end of the vikings by ellen mauer